today's topic is on determining after repair value in a changing market. Um, and I've got to say, you know, in a non-changing market, this is a skill that I think any agent would agree is challenging. When the market is in a state of flux, it is potentially dangerous. <laughs> so um, Todd and I are going to do a little Q&A. If anybody has any questions or comments, uh, please dive in. This is intended to be an interactive conversation. And uh, let's get started. Yeah, and, and just to reiterate what Matt said, I have a couple questions that we've prepared. But please, if you have questions, either uh, unmute yourself and ask. You can put it in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. Um, but I think a great place to start, Matt, is obviously just a basics. What is uh, ARV? What does it stand for? How do we figure it out? And uh, all that fun stuff. Yeah. So ARV stands for after repair value. I often say after renovation value. I think repair is kind of an odd word, but whatever. I didn't make up the acronym. Um, so, you know, put very simply, it is projecting what a piece of property the value of a piece of property after it is renovated, right? And there are a couple of reasons why this skill is critical. Obviously, when you're working with investors, it's critical for them to determine if the project is doable, right? Given their construction budget and the profit they're looking to make. But number two, if somebody's obtaining construction financing, they're going to have to obtain an appraisal that supports whatever value you come up with as an agent. And obviously, if you're coming up with a different value than the appraiser, then your client's going to be wasting money on appraisal uh, costs. Uh, they're going to be wasting titles time. You're going to be wasting your own time, potentially paying a transaction manager to do work they don't need to be doing. So really getting clear on this skill is in my opinion, absolutely critical if you're gonna be working with investors who fix and flip uh, repeatedly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And if I can just second that or, or piggyback, excuse me, um, this skill goes beyond being a great agent or a great investor. I mean, this is truly like uh, economics 101 of what we do. And um, all the problems I've run into in this industry and most of what I hear is between agent and appraiser, investor and appraiser, and a really good way to get through that is just to understand what the appraiser does and how we figure this out. Um, and uh, it's not skilled. And I, I think the best way to do it for me personally was just practice. I would underwrite deals that I had no intention of buying just so I can improve my skills. So Matt, I agree with that. I think that's a great explanation. Well, and and while you bring that up, Todd, you know, I want to like differentiate between an appraisal and an opinion is sure. valued by an agent. Sure. You know, especially when it comes to construction financing. And Connor, please jump in on this point because I just had this conversation with the client yesterday. I'm getting ready to list one of their projects. Their appraisal for the after renovation project came in at a much higher price that I think the deal will sell for. You know, I'm of the opinion that. You know, those appraisals can be massaged and nuanced, understanding yeah. that the lender only needs to cover the cost of the loan amount, right, right, if they have to resell the asset. So they're, you know, pushing the appraisal by five or 10 or, you know, $20,000 or $30,000, and they're only needing to cover 80% of the project cost. You know, they're going to do it in order to get the job done. Am I right, Connor? Am I like... So as a as a lender, we're supposed to be using independent third party appraisers. You uh, know, that, gave me the politically correct answer. <laughs> well, I, I want the I want the truth. Um, I would. What my opinion is that the appraisal is is stats, it's data, and what they're doing is they're looking at particular items, uh, a deck, the below grade finished square footage, and they're adjusting things based on what's been sold, but. What Matt's doing and what agents are doing is they're selling to people. People don't care about the adjustments. That's where the major difference lies. What does the person really want versus what does the data say? Yeah, but Connor, I mean, I don't want to get into a big conversation about appraisals, but I don't think it's any coincidence that most purchase appraisals come in at the purchase contract price. They're lazy. I just, you know, refinance <laughs> my own house. 
and told him the loan amount. And lo and behold, it came in right <laughs> at the loan amount. Right. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, appraisers tend to look for the fastest way to get things done. And based on the information that's available to them, uh, the more complex the deal, such as condo conversions or, uh, you know, five to 10 unit deals, that's when you'll see a little bit more independent studies, let's call it. Okay. Matt, yes. I have a quick question. I know you just said you don't want to talk about appraisals. Let's go for it. This is, uh, this is all good information. I have a question. That's, I really want to know, you just said the appraisals come in for the loan amount, right? So I was at my sister's and my niece bought my sister's condo. Yes. The appraiser came out. Uh, I was in her kitchen. He looked for two, I, I videotaped him because I'm a weirdo. And he was there for three seconds. And I, I mean, I Snapchatted him because again, I thought it was hilarious. And that was the appraisal. And it came in for the the right amount. It's not a coincidence. I always say I should have been an appraiser. Well, so here's the thing, guys. You know, and God bless. Like I don't care. Make your money, but a, a, a market analysis by an agent <clears throat> is meant to determine market value based not only on past sales, which is what an appraiser is going to use. Right. It can be based on active listings, you can be looking at canceled, expired, withdrawn listings, listings that didn't sell. I'm looking at supply and demand. I'm looking at market trends. I'm looking at all sorts of different things. And then using my experience in listing selling properties to determine a marketable price for a piece of property. An appraiser has a contract in hand. They see what a buyer is willing to pay for a property. And their report is for a lender, right? To shield a lender against losses. That's the purpose of an appraiser. Very, very infrequently will you have a homeowner call an appraiser and say, come you know, determine a value for my house and the appraiser has no place to start. That's really, really uncommon. It happens sometimes very infrequently. So I think the reason why you find the appraisal come in at the purchase price is because the, the appraiser has a contract to start from. Right. Okay. Yeah. And even though I don't believe appraisers are supposed to do this and maybe we should have an appraiser on there, maybe there's an appraiser watching this somewhere. You know, I've always been of the opinion that if a buyer is putting 20 or 25 percent down, right, on, let's say, a five hundred thousand dollar house. So 20 percent down is going to be one hundred thousand dollars. If that appraiser appraises the house for five twenty five right? And the lender only needs to cover $400,000 because that's a loan amount. Whatever, who cares? You know what I mean? I mean, the, the, the bank's going to get their money back. You know, the appraiser's job is to ensure that the bank doesn't incur losses. Amen. Anything else? Amen. Okay. Um, all right, Matt, if I may, second question, second thought, how is an ARV determined? I know you kind of touched on it already, but maybe some more of the nuance. Yes. All right. So the first thing I wrote down, guys, is know your client. Know the client that you're dealing with. You know, if somebody calls me out of the blue and says, I'm renovating 123 Main Street, what's it going to be worth in six months? You know, my answer to that person is, I have no clue. Like, I don't, if I haven't worked with you before, I don't know the quality of construction. I don't know what materials you use. I don't know really anything about the finished product. And as we all know, you know, quality finishes selections somebody's personal taste you know somebody could do excellent quality work and just have really crappy you know taste and selections that's going to totally prevent a sale from happening at any price so if you don't know the client you're dealing with i would say hit the brakes and either provide a very broad range for that client or get to know their work, look at past projects that they've done, walk through the projects physically if possible. Be careful about doing this research for somebody if you don't know them, because remember, that person is relying on you as the agent 
to invest potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars and make you know a fraction of that as profit. So that's first and foremost. Um, number two, work off of the correct square footage. I think this is one of the biggies where people mess up. And the Philadelphia public tax records sometimes are on point with the square footage, sometimes are not on point with the square footage, right? If a building was once two-story and been converted to three-story, the city may not know that. If you're trying to determine at the value of a 1,200 square foot building, when in reality, the building's 1,600 square feet, you're gonna come up with two very, very different numbers. So a hack that I wanna share with all of you, this isn't foolproof, but this is a way of um, double checking square footage. Most builders of Philadelphia row homes built on 75% of the lot size. So in the uh, public records, you're going to see what the lot dimensions are. I'm gonna use 16 by 72. All right, so that gives me 1,152 square feet. 75% of that is 864 feet per floor. So if you're dealing with a two-story house, the likelihood is that the building is around 728 square feet. If there's a huge discrepancy between that number and what you see in the tax record, then you're gonna wanna go out and measure it or have your photographer measure it or somehow get, um, if the, uh, if the owner has an old appraisal of the property, that should have uh, a sketch of the property. You want to make sure that you're working off of accurate square footage. Do not rely on Zillow. Zillow combines above grade and below grade square footage. Don't always rely on the tax records. You really got to dig in there and make sure you're doing your homework. Questions on that? No, I, no. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Did you just do this? How did you find this out, Matt? Just by try, you know, Doing your job. I am a genius. That's why I am a genius. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I forget who told me that. Um, but you know, it was uh, it was a really cool trick to learn because it's a really good way to double check what you're looking at. You know, so the first thing that yeah. I do is go on Google Maps or Apple Maps, look at a street view of the building. Right. And then the year, obviously, if it's a four years old from Apple or Google, whatever. But if it's if it's a recent photo, you can see how big the building is, how many stories. Yeah. Right. If it's a three story building and the tax records is showing 900 square feet, it's probably not correct. So you're going to want to use that equation to double check. No, that's so cool. That's fun. like that's cool to share with someone else, too. Like tax millages, there's new like title people that don't know you can figure out taxes without like looking them up, like because math. So that's really cool information. Yeah. I just actually, you know, true story. I just listed a property um, in the tax records. It showed 1,784 square feet. I walked through the property It felt much, much larger than that. When I did the calculation, it came out to 2,400 and some square feet. And I was competing with two other agents. My recommended value was 850,000. The other agents were at a much lower value based off of the lower square footage. I got the listing. It's under contract at full price. Proof is in the pudding. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Great job. Yeah, it's, it's nice to hear the successes when you, for lack of a better term, just apply logic to what we do. So well done, Matt. Yeah, thank um, you. How, how three, you, had, you put three, I put three, winner takes all. I'm five years out the ring. I'm a kick. We know who that is. I know who that is. No idea what that is. I'm a retired old man, five years. I've been sitting around smoking cigars. And what is going on? Here? He got busted because of pizza boxes in Romania. <laughs> Don't worry about Floyd Mayweather. Uh, you only want to lose Andrew, to them so you can you pull off the All right. We have been hacked, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting. Aliens have invaded Red Philly. Okay. Um, a couple of other things on this, guys. Uh, aside from knowing the client, know what they're planning to do with the property. You know, Different people do different things. 
is there going to be new electric? Is there going to be new plumbing? Is there going to be HVAC? Is there going to be central air? That's a really big one. Is there going to be parking? No parking. Are they going to be adding square footage? Are they going to be finishing square footage below grade? Get as many specs as you can about the property before supplying a value. All right. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, good job, Matt. Uh, thank you for bringing it back. Uh, how does an ARV change in a changing market that we are currently in? But I think we skipped a question. <laughs> Did we? Yes, number two. So how do you determine ARV? Let's just start with the basics. Sure. And I want to say, guys, every agent might do this differently. You know, I am doing this day in and day out. So I'm going to share with you my method and, you know, whether or not you do the same thing or something different, this works for me and works for my clients really well. So the first thing that I do is I look in the smallest possible radius within the subject property. Um, in bright MLS, that's 0.1 miles. 0.1 miles is about two to three city blocks, encompasses about 72 taxable parcels of real estate. So it's a even though it sounds like a small number, it's a big enough. If you live in the city, if you think three blocks, north, south, east, and west of your property, it's, a, it's enough of a sample size that you should be able to pull some information. If I'm not finding any renovated sales, in the last six months, let alone the last 60 or 90 days, then to me, that's going to be a warning sign that this may not be a great flip, right? If you're not going to be, you know, you know it's always uh, a dangerous idea to be the most expensive house in the neighborhood. And especially if there are no other renovated properties within, you know, a three block radius, north, south, east, and west, I would say, you know, that could be a little bit of a higher risk. Um, the second thing I wrote down is I'm always looking for patterns. So a lot of times I see agents and wholesalers try to cherry pick comparable sales. Oh, well, this one house sold for 500, right? But then there are 30 other that sold for 250. You know, you know, hanging your hat on that one sale is never a good idea. If you see a pattern of sales, I like to see at least three or four in the same, you know, 5%, 10% range, then you can go ahead and, and take the next step um, and, you know, give your client a thumbs up. Another thing that I like to do. Matt. Is, yeah. Are you looking at. Uh, total square footage, like total livable square footage, or above just grade. above grade when you're comparing properties? Only above grade. All right. Very good. Because going going back to appraisers, when they're looking at uh, their price per square foot, it is only based off of above grade square footage. So when people start Googling only. properties and see Zillow show, showing a square footage of a higher amount, it's because Zillow includes the below grade square footage in their in their calculations. Yeah. And here's the thing, guys, you know, I've got clients, this happens a lot of new construction. I'm getting a little off topic, but I'll make this quick. The clients will say, oh, just put the entire square footage in there, you know, as above grade square feet. Well, the danger to doing that is if a buyer is seeing four properties that are 2,500 square feet above grade, and you have 1,800 square feet above grade, but you're trying to you know, increase foot traffic by marketing at 2,500 square feet, a buyer is going to go in and immediately realize that this property is substantially smaller, smaller kitchen, smaller bedroom, smaller bathroom, smaller everything. And it, it doesn't work. You know, it's misleading and it's, it's a strategy for failure. Um, another thing that I like to do, guys, if I'm having a challenge in you know finding any sort of in connecting the dots shall we say i'll go into the tax record and i'll look on a specific block so for example i live on the 1400 block of south 13th street i might pu pull up public records from 1400 to 1500 block sort by date of deed recorded and see the most recent recorded deed and everything that's transferred, keeping in mind that for sale by owner transactions are going to be recorded in the public record and not in MLS. 
So if you're able to establish, again, some sort of pattern of values on a block, then that can give you the confidence to say to an investor, yes, this is gonna be a good investment or no, it's not gonna be a good investment. Um, and the last thing that I wanna bring up, and um, I think this is a great one, Connor had added this to the list here is, you wrote down cross double lines when comparing. So, you know, in Philadelphia, especially, if you look at a map, even if you don't know the city, you can see where the, uh, many times you can see where neighborhoods start and stop, right? Broad Street is a hard delineation between East Philly and West Philly. Marcus Street is a hard delineation. Germantown Avenue is often a delineation between neighborhoods. If you're seeing major avenues and you're crossing those avenues to pull sales from a potentially different neighborhood and you're not familiar with it, I'd be careful about that. Try to stay within a really small radius. Questions, guys? No, if uh, no questions, uh, maybe I can go back to the previous one I, I asked about uh, how you determine an ARV in a market like this that's never, ever ending and changing. Yeah. Well, I was selling real estate in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> you know, when the market went like this and then like this and all over the place. And what I can share with you from firsthand experience is it really depends on the location of the product. In a transitioning market, meaning transitioning from a seller's market to a buyer's market, the tried and true solid locations, you know, whether that's known neighborhoods in the city or in suburbs, a lot of times it's by school district, you know, the better the location, the more market resistant those prices are going to be. Um, what I I'm seeing right now as the market has changed are what look like incredible deals in very transitional neighborhoods. You know, you can pick up a property for 15 or $20,000 and people think, Ooh, this is great. You know, I'm going to pick up this property and, and flip it and, you know, make a huge profit. And five or six months from now, those neighborhoods are likely to take a much, much larger decrease in prices than neighborhoods that everybody knows, you know, the Fairmounts, the Northern Liberties, the Fishtowns, the Pashunks, et cetera. So right now I am encouraging my investors to stay in areas like Mount Airy, Germantown, Passing Square, you know, certain pockets of South Philadelphia, um, for fix and flips. Now, what Todd does, buy and holds, totally different thing. You might find a great deal. And if you're willing to hold that property for 20 years, who cares what's going to happen in the next two years? You know, you're going you're gonna to come up with a valuable asset in the long run. One thing that a lot of agents that I'm talking with, I'm in a mastermind group with agents um, across the country and in Canada. And one thing that a lot of people are doing are cross-checking values that they're coming up with today with pre-COVID values, meaning from 2019, before we had that COVID bubble happen in 2021 and the beginning of 22. Um, you can't use this information on an appraisal. This is simply a check and balance. But if you're coming up with a value, you're having a little bit of trouble, you go back and if you try to do an analysis based off of sales in that year, and the values are consistent, then I would say you're probably on track. Question yeah. about that. No, Matt, I think that's a really good point that you made uh, about the pre-COVID numbers because even my, even my model with the buy and hold, I'm I'm amazed about how the ARVs have, it. it it's, it's almost like, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, but it's almost like there's no logic to what the ARVs are doing. And I, I like looking at it from a couple of years ago because it does, for someone who's thinking 20 years down the road, that that ship is going to continue to float and take a smooth course to where I needed to get to. So that's a good point. Um, have you ever run into a situation or what if like you just have no idea what the ARV is and you can't figure it out? What do you do then? Then I tell the client I can't figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, then I, you know, I obviously I can't be part of that project. Um, 
I, you know, personally, I try to stay in areas that I'm familiar with and I want to be as honest as I can with a client. Now I'm not an analytical person on the disc personality scale, but I can be surprisingly data-driven when it comes to determining value. So I'm looking at literally a, a situation from, you know, a 365 degree angle. Um, but, you know, I think if you've been selling real estate long enough, I mean, you know where the, the good locations are, you know where the mm, locations are, and then you know where the really risky locations are. And, um, you know, I never want to encourage a client to make an investment in a risky location unless they're willing to hold the property if it doesn't sell. I've seen too many people lose money. Questions. I agree. Okay, and then the last thing, guys, is look at the month supply of inventory. God, it's been so long since I've had to do this, but literally for every listing that I took in 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, I would be looking at how many months supply of inventory is there for this price range and location. So month supply of inventory is simply the number of active listings on the market and the number of listings that are selling each month. If you divide one by the other, you're gonna get a number. What we know for sure is that a six month supply, of, well, four to six month supply of inventory is a balanced market, meaning prices are relatively flat. Less than a four month supply of inventory is a seller's market, prices are increasing. For much of 20 and 2021 in the suburbs, there was a one week supply of inventory. So prices were literally increasing by percentages every single week. Uh, but if I see that there's a three month supply of inventory, that's a really, really good sign. Four, five, six months of supply of inventory, I'm not feeling so good about more than a six supply of inventory. Month supply of inventory is a buyer's market. At seven months supply, I've done this research, I know prices start to decline. So if you're in that sort of a market or you're analyzing a property in that sort of a market, beware, it's not gonna be a good investment. You're not likely to be able to cash out of that. All right, guys, what questions, comments do people have? Is there something in the chat, Todd? No, sorry. You get I a comment I this video, yes. So Matt, do you have any recommendations if I know we're supposed to be looking, you know, like in kind, like same number of bedrooms, similar square footage, a uh, deck versus, uh, you know, another size deck. Do you have any recommendations for if things aren't so apples to apples and it's apples to orange? Well, so, you know, it's so funny that you put this question on the Word document, Connor, because I completely forgot you know, when you're selling real estate in the city and they're row homes and you're looking in the same neighborhood, more than likely the neighboring properties are going to be the same house, right? I mean, you have rows and rows and rows of the same property. So it's unlikely that you're going to, you know, look within a, a 0.1 mile radius and find a detached house here and a twin here and a row home here and this there and that there. Normally it's going to be the same house. But I think you bring up a really good point, you know, depending on where you're looking, if you're looking in some of the more suburban areas of Philadelphia, like Torresdale, where there's a lot of detached homes or Overbrook Farms, of course, you want to be looking for the same style of house, meaning is it attached? Is it a twin? Is it detached? The same approximate square footage, the same approximate bedrooms and bathrooms. Um, you know, if it has parking, great. If it doesn't have parking, you know, you can make an adjustment or do more research to figure out what parking is worth in that location. But you know, you want it to ideally try to find the same house multiple times at a very, very similar value to be able to say to somebody, hey, here are three sales that have occurred in the past six months. They're all within 200 square feet of each other and they're all within 3% of this price you know, Mr. Buyer, I believe that the market will support that value going forward. 
perfect. I, I appreciate that, especially when you have like parking versus no parking. I think that's where the biggest, uh, biggest difference can lie and say, Hey, this is worth 10,000 in this area, 20,000 in this area. Yeah. And it's tough to put a price tag on that. I mean, it really, really is. Um, so, you know, I guess the, the best thing that I would say with this to any agent who's working with investors is take your time, do your homework, be meticulous, right? Because, you know, 20% profit, which is what most agent, uh, investors are looking for, anybody who's ever done a construction project, that can fly out the window like that. I mean, that amount of money can be eaten up so quickly if you aren't doing your analysis super, super carefully. Oh, and last thing, don't rely on Zillow or Redfin estimates. It's an algorithm. They're often off by as much as 20%. It says that on the website. So get with an agent who knows what they're doing. What other questions, guys? Matt, do you, you work outside of the city as well? I don't. You don't? Okay. I, don't. I have a... Um... I have a phobia of traffic, Charlene. What's that? I have a phobia of traffic. You know, if I'm in my car for longer than 30 minutes and I just start to get a little agita. Oh, well, if you need a driver, I'm masterful at Martin Luther King <laughs> Drive in 76. I knew all the potholes. Um, so I have a guy who he buys up. Um, he's re he buys a lot in Coatesville and that part of like Chester County and um, he uses, he's used me for like every title company I've been to, but he will ask me things that really belong to a realtor and he's used different realtors and he's called me at midnight. And thankfully I've been able to answer some of the questions and then draft letters and say, have your realtor sign it because some of his realtors are, are just not knowledgeable. Um, so yeah. Let's connect offline. You know, okay. I can, I can, you know, sleuth around and, you know, it's not just finding an agent, it's finding an agent who works in this space a lot. Right. You know, uh, you could be a fabulous residential listing agent and not really be familiar with doing this type of analysis. I mean, it really takes doing it over and over and over again and really knowing what you're doing, knowing the location that you're working in to be able to do it well. Right. Uh, so, you know, partnering uh, your client or your investor with the right agent is really critical to being able to be profitable, especially as the market continues to shift around. And he does mixed. So I think that would be great to hook him up with someone. Okay. Anything else, guys? All right, so our next uh, grid meeting, which Todd and I are super excited about, is featuring Alan Dom, who is legendary in the city of Philadelphia. He'll be joining us in person on the 23rd um, at our office building at 325 Chestnut. It's at 10 in the morning on the fourth floor. You all will be getting more information for that via email, but mark your calendars. Alan is always a wealth of information. So we're super excited to have him. All right, thank you, Keystone. Thank you, Charlene, Connie. Thank you, Connor. Hi, Connie. Thank you, Todd. We'll talk to you next month, guys. Bye guys, thank you. Bye -bye.